Hello everyone, welcome to the Central Beloit YouTube channel and thanks for checking us out. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week at centralwire.com or on Facebook and Instagram. We hope this message meets you right where you're at. Enjoy. Hey, everybody glad you're here? Glad that stinking snow stopped? Hey, Joshua, you're awesome. Thank you, sir. I love you. And I love you, but it's going to get weird here in a moment. Uh, my campus pastors, if you don't know us, if you're here for the first time, first time in a long time, uh, man, we are delighted to have you with us. And we're one church in multiple locations, uh, 10 offerings of worship every weekend, two in Janesville, uh, four here, uh, two in McChesney Park, an inner city campus, and a Spanish-speaking congregation. And so we're all over the map. But uh, yesterday afternoon, mid-afternoon, I got a call from um, campus pastors that the message I was going to do this weekend, we couldn't pull off. This message is so significant and vital for the, the life, the presence, and the future of our church that we were going to broadcast it simultaneously to our campuses. But then last night happened, not enough technology, not enough teams of people to make that happen. And so my, the campus pastor said they were going to preach the sermons that they had prepared for next week, which I haven't worked on yet. <laughs> and so um, I understood. I hung up the phone. They said they were all good. And um, I, my Deb and I, we were, if you don't know me, um, I've been the pastor here for 38 years. My Deb and I have been married for 45 years. We were out slinging sand and salt, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to talk about if I can't do the, the talk that I've worked hours and hours on and, and rehearsed and readied? On the way to church last night, Debbie asked me, she, she said, so what are you going to preach? I'm like, I don't know. And I, I went to my office about a half hour before church started, got down on my knees, put my face on the floor, and cried out to the Lord, Father, what, what do you want me to preach? And um, so he gave me this message, and if you don't like it, blame him. <laughs> but dude, I need prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Father, you have been so stinking faithful. Uh, last night, 8.15, 9 o'clock this morning, and now 9. I look to you, Lord. There's, there's nothing good that can come out of me or my efforts, but if you will once again anoint me with your Holy Spirit, then you can wield your word to touch life after life and relationship after relationship, hurt after hurt in this room. Please do it to your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, so here's the deal. Here's the text that the Lord led me to. There's this king, king of uh, Judah. Jerusalem is a capital city, capital city of the Jewish faith. This king's name is Hezekiah, and he is overwhelmed. His city has been surrounded by an Assyrian army, and they have the latest in weaponry. Uh, weaponry. They outman the soldiers in Jerusalem, 100 to 1. It wouldn't even be a fight. It would be a bloodbath. And so the king is beside himself. From all appearances, his city is going to be destroyed because this Assyrian army has already destroyed city after city after city. Not only did they destroy the city, they would go into the heart of the city where the temple would be to that city's God, whoever that might be, and they just burned the place to the ground. And so this king, Hezekiah, um, he believes that uh, the king of the Assyrian army, Sennacherib, is going to do a, a, a massacre on the people of Jerusalem. Now, I don't know, I, I have a sense, when I was working on the sand and the salt yesterday, I just wondered, because I knew the weather was going to be bad last night, and I was like, you know, why do people go to church? 
What will make them come? The previous Saturday, we had like over 400 people at our Saturday night service. Last night, I threw a bomb out in the auditorium and didn't kill anybody. We had like 100 people. But I thought to myself, what makes people want to come? And I know sometimes because you tell me and I pray with you that you come because you got struggles, you got hurts, and you believe that God can heal and God, God can help and God can bring mercy and God can bring compassion. God can bring comfort. And so you come with your struggles looking for help and hope. And other times, you just, I mean, you've gone to church all your life, so you feel like, man, it's the right thing to do. It's us. It's our family. This is what we do. So when Sunday shows up, you show up. Uh, I don't want to say it's a sense of obligation, but you're here because you think it's the right thing to do. Well, I think from those two extremes, come looking for help, looking for help, looking for help, and doing the right thing at the center where we want to calibrate our lives and our hearts is that we are here because we love Jesus more than anything. And we will fight the elements. And we will make sacrifices. And we will make it the priority of our lives because we, want, we love him so much we want to sing to him and we want to worship and adore and celebrate his goodness. I mean, he is good to us, but we want to celebrate him because he is our God. He is our Lord. We look back over the course of our lives and we look, oh my gosh, look how good Jesus has been to me and not just that. You know what? I anticipate more goodness from his hand in the days to come. And I just love him. I want to hear his word for my life. I want to be with his people. I want to be with the body of Christ and together we love the Lord. But I know it is human nature at times to be overwhelmed. And I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you this because some of you don't know me, but I came to this church 38 years ago, first weekend of August 1981, and I was here five months before I got fired. Yeah. And it kind of caught me by surprise. I mean, I, I knew, here's what I did not know. I did not know um, that small churches are typically dominated by one family. And um, these guys didn't like me. They liked the pastor that was here before me, but I wasn't like him, and they didn't like me. And I think everything's going good. There was a season Um, 13 weeks, during that five months, 13 weeks in a row, when someone gave their life to Christ and was baptized. I think that's all good. Then I start getting phone calls from folks who are saying, hey, we feel uncomfortable seeing these folks in our church that we don't know. I love that I'm not in a small church anymore. But um, so it came 1st of August. When 1st of December came, I wanted to... I mean, this is a part of my problem. This is my problem I take responsibility for. I come from a medium-sized church of about 500 people on the weekend. And where I was, we would have these big Christmas Eve by candlelight services. So I said, hey, let's have a Christmas Eve by candlelight service. And they're like, we don't do that here. In fact, I went so far on a limb. um, You you guys, this will show your age. Do you remember uh, the folk group back in the 70s, the New Christie Minstrels. Okay, some of you that, uh, they sang like this. I'd love to teach the world to sing in perfect time. Okay, you're glad they're gone. But (laughs) one of the guys from that group was from this area, and he came to church, and I met him, and I thought, hey, this would be awesome. Would you be the featured vocalist at our Christmas Eve by candlelight service? And, you know, we're not a rich church or a little church, but I could, you know, give you 50 bucks. And I was so excited. I told folks about that, and they said, what? We believe that $50 would be better spent on groceries for the poor. Now, I got to admit, I was in my 20s. I was a little brassy. That means smart alecky. And I said, oh, you know what? I bet we got a $100 God. 50 bucks for Christmas Eve, 50 bucks for... (laughs) That didn't go over real well. In fact, I had to call a guy and say, I'm sorry, you can't come. 
But when we held the Christmas Eve by candlelight service that had never been done before, the place was packed out, standing room only. I felt, my perspective, God was at work in this church, and I was celebrating it. But one month later, I was called to a private meeting, kind of a secret meeting, and I was asked to resign. And I was given a list of things that I did poorly. And I thought, is that the best you can do? I can tell you 10 more things that are way worse about me than that. <laughs> but I, I said at the time, I said, um, I said, you know, I've, I've got a son that's a year old, and I have a son that's three years old. And if I could just have enough time to find another place to serve so that it doesn't hurt my family. They were like, no, 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 you're gone now. And, and it wasn't just um, that I got fired. Here, here's what happened. A week later, the congregation, the church family, um, had my back. Um, they took a public stand and said, we want David and Debbie to stay. And uh, these other folks said, if they stay, we're leaving. They said, no, no, we want you to stay. We want them to stay. They said, if they're staying, we're gone. And so the leaders from uh, that m church family meeting came to our home and said, you know, our church has come together. We've voted. We want you to stay. And we're like, we're packing. We're like, no stinking way. We've never been treated like this in our lives. We're going someplace else. But every, they, th what they said to me was, would you at least pray about it? I said, yes, oh my gosh. Every time I prayed, three times in a row, I would be in prayer. <laughs> and this is back in the days when phones had a cord. <laughs> the phone would ring, I'd pick it up, and it was a, a past professor from college, or it was a, a, a friend in ministry, or it was a, a colleague, and they were like, we heard what happened to you, you gotta stay. So, I, I took it as a leading from the Lord, we will stay, we stayed, but I went into a deep, lengthy depression, anxiety-ridden, panic attacks. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, my heart beating out of my chest, all bug-eyed, having had a dream that someone who didn't like me was trying to shoot me. I mean, it was just the grossest time of my life. But i tell you what I did. Every, I mean, I was a mess. I, I needed counseling. I didn't get counseling because I thought, hey, if these folks that have stood up for me, if they find out I'll need counseling, they'll just think I'm damaged good and they'll want to get rid of me. But I went to the best counselor in the world, the Holy Spirit, and I talked to him in prayer, and I went into his word every day. And I tell you the truth, I was so anxiety-ridden. And the panic attacks were so, came out of nowhere so fierce, I couldn't hold two thoughts in my mind together at the same time. I could read scripture um, for five minutes and couldn't tell you what I'd read. So you know what I did? I started writing down the word of God. I would read it, I would write it, and I don't know how this works. Because I still do it. This morning, Psalm 27, I'm at our dining room table, having had my oatmeal. That's what old people eat. And I'm writing down the Word of God. And the same thing happened this morning that happened way back then. God speaks. His promises become clear. His, his comfort is real and felt. Now, I'll be real with you. It took six months for me to get undepressed. Six months of spending time in His Word. Six months of crying out to Him in prayer. But in that six months, He was, he, he was, he was faithful. Never again an anxiety uh, problem, never again a panic attack, never again depressed. But it came, th this is why we are encouraging you to get one or both of these books. I have read this, done it with my Debbie. I, I am reading this one right now to gain new in insights into God's Word. But this is what happens to Hezekiah. I've been overwhelmed with my struggles, emotional, mental, physical, financial, relational. You've been overwhelmed by your struggles. And so I looked at God's word, and I saw this text, and I began to practice what I found here. Hezekiah, he says this. He goes, Hezekiah is the king of God's people. He goes to the prophet of God, and it's kind of weird because he says to the prophet of God, um, will you pray to your God for me? 
which reminded me of my mom. Some of you have known my mom for a long time since I've been here for a long time. But my mom, if she's in the hospital and her pastor shows up, she says, what are you doing here? Go out and talk to somebody who needs Jesus. I know Jesus. I can pray for myself. (laughs) That's my mom. Well, Hezekiah, he goes to the prophet of God and says, please pray to your God, not to our God, not to my God. You talk to your God for me because he says this. He says, today is a day of trouble. And not just trouble. I mean, he says trouble, insults, and disgrace. He sees something is terribly wrong. And he puts it on Facebook. And he starts being degraded and demeaned and disrespected and insulted on Facebook, just like you have when you put your trouble there. You can probably tell that I'm anti-social media. <laughs> I just, all the parents are clapping. The kids are going, no, no, no. Um, but but there, there have been times when trouble has hammered your life and mine. And it's not just that we feel disrespected in our marriage or from our children, but if things keep going down this path, we are going to be absolutely disgraced. That's Hezekiah. Look at that vast army. They got the weapons. We got nothing. They got the trained soldiers. We got nothing. They had this reputation of destroying towns and temples and gods. Would you talk to your God? And Isaiah does. Isaiah prays for Hezekiah and immediately says this, this is what the Lord says. You asked me to pray, I prayed, and this is what God says. Do not be disturbed. Do not be disturbed. Listen. Do I have your full attention, Hezekiah? Listen. I myself will move. Now, there have been times in my life, if you don't know our family, we have two biological boys. Those two little guys years ago are now big grown men. And we have two adopted children from Haiti, both of whom are adults now. Our son, Wilkie, uh, is 30. Our daughter, Lovia, uh, is 21, going on. Yeah. Um, But, you know, love him. But when we were trying to get Wilkie out of Haiti and adopt him, it was one big mess for two years. In fact, we we had to go to the expense of adopting him twice because the U.S. government kept saying no. He'd been approved in Haiti, but the U.S. government kept saying no, no, no. And then they said, well, if you do it all again, we'll, we'll, we'll say yes. But when we did it all again, they kept saying no. And he had a broken femur. He got hit by a car, and his, his leg was broken. And, um, and so, I mean, if God had told me on October 15th of such and such year, that was the date when Wilkie came to our home, the boy that God had put in our hearts was now our son. If I had just known, I wouldn't have been so stinking disturbed. But I was financially disturbed. My Debbie lived in Haiti for over nine months. Our marriage was hurting because of that. And I just got so sick of coming home to a dark, empty house and eating those microwave uh, meals. And finally, one time, I'd had it. I uh, was in our little breakfast nook, and I was giving it to God. What is up with you, God? Are you supposed to be the father of the fatherless? You're supposed to put the lonely in family? And what is the benefit of me being a pastor if you're not going to come through on your end? What's the benefit of me being a Christ follower if you're not going to come through on your end? What's the benefit of me serving you if you won't serve me? And then I got a grip. I was crying, yelling, did the Bible study of the insane. (laughs) Have you ever done that? Hey, guess where my finger fell? Psalm 103. You know what Psalm 103? I have it memorized now, even all these years later. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. 
He forgives all your sins, David. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things. And so I got up uh, off my seat at the table, laid my Bible aside, and I just started, I know I'm weird, but I just started marching around our house saying, this is a good thing with which you can satisfy my heart. I want that boy to be my son. And he was, he is. God is faithful. But I'm sorry, this is not one of those messages that I practice, 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 so I get screwed up sometimes. Um, but had I only known, God was saying, like David, dude, don't be so disturbed. I am on the move. You want me to tell you about some of the moves God made? Just in this simple scenario of adopting our son, Wilkie. There's this girl who grows up in Iowa. Now she's a young woman. There's this guy from Clinton, Wisconsin, who, who was down in Tennessee. And the two of them moved to Chicago, unaware of each other, but meet each other on a blind date. Like each other, fall in love with each other. He brings her home to meet his parents. She comes to church with him. She hears the story about our struggles and getting Wilkie out of Haiti. Her mom happens to be the ambassador to the Barbados. She calls up her mom. Mom, I can't believe the struggle of this family. It's a good family. They're having getting this child out of Haiti. He's got a broken leg. Can you, Mom, can't you do something? So the mom contacts Haiti. She gets back from Haiti from a U.S. official a letter giving the list of reasons why Wilkie is unadoptable. Never going to happen. He's never leaving Haiti. At the same time, she emails that to me, and then she gets on a plane and flies to Miami. Goes into one of those underground bunkers, government deals. She violates all kinds of protocol. She had been a senator in the U.S. Congress from Iowa. Had a friend from the Senate who now was in Tom Ridge's Homeland Security Office. She bypasses all the things she's supposed to go through. Goes right to Tom Ridge because of that friend. Says to Tom Ridge, here's the situation. Good family, good boy, hurting for certain. Can't you do something? How can you sleep with yourself if you don't do something? He did something. At the same time, I go home from church on a Saturday night, get a phone call. My Debbie's gone. She's back in Haiti. And on the phone, this guy introduces himself as Dr. Anthony Sorkin. said, Pastor Clark, you don't know me. I've heard your story. Um, but I want to do your son's rod insertion surgery for free. I've made an arrangement with Rockford Memorial Hospital. They'll cover all medical expenses for free, and I'm writing the U.S. government to confirm this. Those two people, God was moving in the heart of Dr. Anthony Sorkin. God was moving in the heart of that family, that ambassador. They both went to work, and as a result, made the right calls to the right officials, and Wilkie came home as our son. Yeah. Now, that's my story. You got your story. You got stuff disturbing you in your marriage or in your finances or in your emotions or at your work or in your school. My, my, my counsel to you comes from God's word. Don't be disturbed. God is saying, I'm on the move. I'm actively at work to your good. You don't know when I'm going to get it done. You don't know how I'm going to get it done. Uh, for Hezekiah, to tell you the truth, that happens overnight. For the Clark family, it took a couple years. It took six months for me to get undepressed, but God spoke to Hezekiah, and what he said to him, he says to you, don't be disturbed. I got this. I myself will move. And so the other pastors at our other campuses are preaching today letters Jesus wrote to the churches of Asia Minor, but I'm preaching to you a letter the devil wrote. Aren't you glad you came? And I'll tell you the truth, just like Jesus sends us messages, so Satan sends us messages. And here's the message he sent through Sennacherib to King Hezekiah. Don't let your God, whom you trust, deceive you by his promises. Don't let God deceive you. You know what I found in the 38 years I've been here post Depression. I cling 
to every promise of God's word. As I was writing out Psalm 27 this morning at our dining room table, I was claiming the promises. I will not forsake you. I will not leave you. Even if your mom and dad forsake you, you will be mine and be mine forever. Such is my love. I'll take that baby to the bank. And so send the church. Don't you trust your God? Hey, other cities had gods, and we wiped them out. Other cities had temples. We burned them to the ground. And don't you think your God can stop me? Ain't nobody, ain't nothing can stop me. That's the King James Version. (laughs) When Hezekiah got that letter, I'll just tell you the story. Instead of reading it, he, he goes to God's house. And spreads that letter out on God's altar. And that's what I did. The letter that the ambassador to the Barbados sent me from the U.S. official in Haiti saying all the reasons that Wilkie would never be adopted. I took it to church. To what we call our chapel. I laid it on the altar. People from our church, our Spanish-speaking congregation came around me and prayed. The people from our Spanish-speaking work, I had no idea what they were saying. But I felt like it triggered the work of God. And I did it. I did that because I had been in God's word. I'd been in God's word. And I find this promise that when you get a letter that you think is evil, that is wrong, that is standing in your way, don't be disturbed. God is on the move. Go to his house. Lay it on his altar. Pray. See what God does. Here's what happens. Now Hezekiah is going to pray. Isn't this wonderful? He's made the transition for a, from asking somebody else to pray for him. He's going before the throne of God. And Hezekiah, he prayed this prayer. O Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty angels. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And so that became my prayer. God, see what we're going through. Bend down. Involve yourself. Intervene in our behalf. You're greater than the U.S. government. You're greater than the Haitian government. You're greater than all the, the kingdoms of the earth. Oh, God, God, see, hear, and respond. Now, O Lord, our God, rescue us. You alone, O Lord, are God. Then, oh my gosh, the wildest thing, the most unbelievable, the most unprecedented thing takes place. Isaiah the prophet of God, who had initially gone to God in Hezekiah's behalf, Isaiah, he says, this is what the Lord your God, the God of Israel says, because you prayed. You came to God's house, laid the letter on God's altar, you prayed, and now God's going to work a miracle. That's the way it always works. I read that. I practiced it. Nothing good ever happens. But by prayer, how does a little bitty church on the other side of town become this great big church of thousands? Only by God. Only by God in response to the prayers of his people. How does a know-nothing, nobody from nowhere who was a mess in his 20s get to stay at this church and watch what God does only by prayer. How is it that you and I, a church family, would have such a tight, loving relationship with each other only in answer to prayer? Because you prayed. Because you pray. God speaks this word. And basically, here's what God says. Hey, dude, chill. They're not going to shoot one arrow at you. They're not going to march through your gates. They are not going to build earth and ramps against the walls of this city because I'm taking them out. I'm taking them back to the place from which they've come. I'm taking them back by the way they've come. And so me, when I have struggles, when I have difficulties, I don't get disturbed. I pray and I say, God, take that problem back to the place from which it's come. 
Whatever's upset in my marriage, whatever's upset in my relationship with my kids, take that problem back to the place from which it's come. And if I believe that it's Satan who's responsible for the struggle I'm in, Lord, drag him back into the pit of hell where he belongs and should stay. <laughs> and then, I know it doesn't always happen like this. I mean, for me, it was six months of anxiety and panic attacks and depression to get undepressed. It was, it was two years in the adoption process, uh, bringing Wilkie to America as our son, and then similar process, getting Lovia to come as our daughter. Um, but this time, it happens overnight. And what happens is that God sends the death angel, and the death angel at God's command wipes out 180 5,000 soldiers in the enemy camp, corpses everywhere. And when the other soldiers who are still alive get up and see all the dead soldiers, they beat a path back to where they came by the path they came. And God's people were victorious. He rescued, delivered, and saved that's how he still works. Except now, he works through the person of his son Jesus, who died on the cross to pay for our sins, and whom God raised from the dead. And when you surrender your life to Jesus, God goes to work to your good, in your behalf. Don't be disturbed. I myself will move. That's all I got. Would you pray with me? <laughs> Our Father, you are a faithful God, and I'm grateful, Lord, that um, I'm grateful, one, this ain't normal, um, but I'm grateful that you would give me a message and then fill me with your Holy Spirit to preach it. Um, grateful for how you've worked in this church, how you're working still. And I'm believing that it's your perfect time, timing that will set us up next weekend for maybe the most significant sermon I've preached in a long, long time for all of our campuses. Lord, get great glory. We love you. We praise you. We love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We're so glad you were able to catch this week's message online, and we'd love to see you at the service. Join us live Saturday night at 5 or on Sunday at 8.15, 9, and 10.30. Have a great week.